My name is Jean Shinoda Bolin. I have an MD after my name because I'm a medical doctor and a psychiatrist and a Jungian analyst. And that makes me all very respectful and makes me at home in a lot of institutions. But there's that whole other side that has to do with being an activist and a feminist and a woman who has a vision about how when the women of the world come together in circles and influence each other and everything else around that it will change patriarchy into a wholly different kind of society beginning with couples and families and communities and countries and then the world where there will be a balance of male and female and that what women have to offer and the feminine side of people in general is actually what could save communities countries, planets. So I'm an activist, but a hopeful one. And I'm at the UN and uh, working towards such things as influencing the women. And this is a wonderful place to be at the Commission on the Status of Women NGOs, where the NGOs are those non-governmental organizations all over the world who care about women and girls. So they come here and they share ideas with each other and then they go back. Well, ever since I first started being a feminist, we now have the internet and we now have a capacity to bring what happens here via our little devices and satellite kinds of objects that help this to happen. What inspires us here can go all over the world to, to small circles or big conferences. The capacity to influence just in time because the planet is in very much of a difficult position where in the next couple of decades we might have done ourselves in as humanity on this planet. So we have uh, been wearing this button which says 5 WCW India 2022. What if, as I am trusting the women in India who are the most, have the most NGOs, most vivid experiences demonstrating and achieving things, and also all the many different organizations that are NGOs that have to do with women and girls, there's so many of them. And what will happen when 5 WCW comes to India is that there will be a mutual exchange and this may be bring the whole idea of women in circles, women influencing each other and influencing the world and saving the planet, etc. Maybe that as a result 2022 will be a watershed time after which the million circle, the idea of the metaphor circle that tips the scales when circle as an idea and women's wisdom as an idea comes into equal equality with the masculine principle so that it's not a big revolution it is an evolution in individuals that changes us to where the metaphoric million circle is the one that tips the scales so obviously I'm an optimist I've been persisting in doing this ever since I had the sense that it should happen and, and so I wrote this little book called The Man's Circle, How to Change Ourselves in the World. And then it took me into the world. It went to the Parliament of World Religions. It went from there to Geneva to back to California where I was invited to come to an organizing meeting. And by the way, we would like to use the name of your book and call it The Man's Circle Initiative. And attending that meeting were heads of NGOs and the California activists, feminists, and we're an unusual bunch in Northern California because you've always had a spiritual basis. It's like the, the feminists in the East are very much more political and into economics and, it, and things in the, than the Northern California, San Francisco area, uh, which was really the place where women's spirituality and women's circles with the spiritual center got more and more uh, into the world through what we were doing. 
So what does this have to do with the archetypes in us? Well, for one thing, if you have an invitation to join a women's circle and you are attracted to the idea almost immediately, chances are that you have a sisterhood archetype in you. And the sisterhood archetype is the ar archetype of Artemis, the goddess of the hunt, goddess of the moon meaning that she can aim at a target and hit it. It's a target of her own choosing. And the moon side has to do with a, a quality of mysticism, that what you see under a moonlight sky of the, of the planet and everything in it has a natural sense of oneness. And that's a natural kind of Artemis quality. Plus, she is the goddess of the wilderness. She's off the beaten track. She is exploring. She's and in her mythology, she traveled with a group of nymphs, or, or lesser feminine divinities often. And she was the firstborn of twins. So she's born first, and then she watches her mother go into the a horrendous labor. And so goddesses are not like ordinary folks. She becomes the midwife to her mother. And she midwives her brother her twin brother, Apollo, into the world. Well, needless to say, if you're the oldest, if you're a goddess that's the oldest of twins, you're not all that impressed with male gods as in general. It's just like you're, you, you, you come in with a sense of equality. Plus, as it turns out, she had a good relationship with Zeus, uh, who she, by the way, didn't meet until, in her mythology until she was about three or four. And then she was brought by her mother to Mount Olympus to meet the people that were the people, the beautiful, powerful people on Mount Olympus. And the story is by a poet named Callimachus that she sat on his knee and he beamed at her and was delighted and said, little daughter, having a child like you makes it worth Hera's wrath. And then he said, what would you like? I will give you whatever you want. And if you start out in this world as an Artemis, you have a mind of your own from the time you were a little girl. You also have a sense of justice. You're the little girl who, when your brothers are given more freedom than you, you're the little girl who says, it's not fair. And essentially, these qualities are what we see in women who are in the world trying to change it, to make it a fair world, to make it a world where, where a vulnerable, Animals and girls and children are looked after because that was who she looked after. She, she was not only just out in the wilderness, but she was the, the patron goddess, so to speak, of the, the animal, the young of all living creatures, humans and others. So if this starts to fill, fit, fit you, if you always kind of, if you were kind of a Girl Scout, if you like, if you like to ride horses, if you had pets, chances are, you're resonating with what I'm saying. You are an Artemis woman or an Artemis girl, and you have a sense of what's fair, what's just, and you have an affinity for living things. And so it, you, you, if you protest, it's as an activist who, who cares about what she wants to say, basically. Okay, so then when you are a woman who's a professional and who goes to national sorts of meetings and that sort of thing, you'll find that there are, the women there kind of on your, wrist, on your CVs, we all kind of look alike. We've all been accomplished. We've all had a proper education to have our positions and so on. And when I went to the American Psychiatric Association and looked at my profession, at that time it was 89% men and 11% women, and that was, that was back in the day a bit. So it has changed. However, what was interesting for me was it helped me to see the difference between women who are naturally Artemis archetypally and naturally Athena archetypally. Now Athena is a patron goddess, so to speak, of cities. Her, while Artemis is out in the wilderness, uh, thinking type Athena is a strategist, has a fine mind, uh, works well with institutions, likes, to, likes things that are already orderly, and knows how to use power as she grows into positions of power. 
And so initially, she's always gravitated toward men in power, like, like the Zeus's of the world. And this got to be very frustrating with early feminism because it seemed at the beginning that, that we were being betrayed by the women who, who would not identify with us. And yet on the surface, we professionals looked like we were sort of the same. We've been through the same education. And I came to realize how it is that there's an archetypal shift. It, there's a, we're born into the world with sort of archetypal strengths that are like all human abilities. And you call them archetype if they're innate patterns that we naturally live out. So Athena is a little girl who likes to figure things out. She likes to read. She likes to learn uh, from experts. She's, she's very much um, more interested in learning what has already been established and traditional. So she starts out being a, a fine citizen. She doesn't understand activism at all until she discovers often later in life and often as history has changed decades later from where, where feminism began, she discovers, uh, yes, she was found it easy to go up the corporate ladder up until she ran into a ceiling where she found that she felt equal to the men that she worked with in about strategy power. But then when they did their men's, all men's thing, she finds that she is not treated, she's treated as different. She doesn't think of herself that way. Um, well, she may actually, but she doesn't think that, 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 it's, that they will put her one down just because she's a woman. Because she has tried to separate herself from just like all women. She sees herself as the exception. And then she finds that she's treated. No matter how high she achieves, there's some place she learns that she's treated just like a woman. So that's a wake-up call. That's when she decides maybe there's something to feminism after all. Now, Athena, Ath Athena is, uh, it, it's really interesting to me to have explored their symbology and what was uh, associated with them and what they wore out in their costumes of uh, ancient Greece so that you could identify them by what they wore or carried. So here we have Athena wearing, most famous wearing armor and with a helmet showing her face and often uh, holding a spear in her hand. I mean, she is a warrior. But the symbols also means that she uh, guards her tender feelings. She is armored. She's armored intellectually. So rather, in a, it probably started early in life when she trusted and was hurt. And then she put up her intellectual defenses and her achievement and uh, marched into the world. That's often what happened to Athena earlier in life. Um, her symbols are the owl, which is uh, wisdom, and, and Athena grows into that, that area of wisdom, and the, and the capacity to fly over and see the whole picture. That's in Athena, not get caught up in the details, not get caught up in the emotions of the moment. She sees the, the bigger picture from her uh, her owl vision, and at night she can see things that are, are that other people can't quite see clearly. And her shadow side is that she, in her mythology, it's like do what works, which is a shadow side that she may need to wrestle with and find when she touches into some other part of herself, her heart, her soul. You know that yes, you could do a lot of things at work. But that's not what she wants to do, because we evolve out of the pattern that is natural to us. And Athenas do. And when they do, they're wonderful um, for feminists. They're, they're wonderful companions, because they can figure out strategy and things like that. Meanwhile, there is Artemis, whose symbols are like the bow and arrow, that she can aim for a target and hit it. She can persevere. Because you have to learn to use 
the vision to, uh, as to what you want to hit. And that's why those of us who went to medical school or law school or a lot of other schools that require um, a lot of training have had to have a certain capacity to aim for a target, to focus on what it is that we uh, w wanted. And, and um, Artemis has all these animals as symbols because after all she is the goddess of the living, of all living, the young of all living things. But she's got, some of them are rather powerful like the bear, the mother bear, so that she, when an Artemis woman becomes a mother or even if she doesn't become a mother, she has a bear maternal quality to protect the young. So you don't mess with mother bears, and you'd better not mess with a furious Artemis either, who in protection of something that truly matters, stands up to, uh, speaks truth to power pretty easily, actually. So that's a short kind of, you know, you've got one that, that knows the streets and the city and was associated with civilization and the city, the Greeks. And then the other who was associated with the wilderness and new explorations of Athena was the patron goddess of the male hero. There weren't female heroes that she stood behind, but there sure were a number of men that she stood behind. Um, and so you can kind of see the difference between the two. Uh, and the thing about archetypes is that all of them are potential in all of us, but some of, it, some of them are inherently stronger from the beginning. It's like talent. All human talents are common to all of us, but not everybody has a real gift of music or of art or of intellect or of athleticism or something like that. You, we all have the possibility to develop parts of ourselves that are human development part, but that which is innately in us can come to, by the way, rule us. It, they can come to dominate our personality, so we're kind of one-sided folks. So you can be a one-sided Athena or a one-sided Artemis when what's more natural is you grow through different ones at different times and uh, find yourself a whole person who has come here for a reason. And the, the idea of, of uh, that, that goes behind all of my writings really is a connection to what Carl Jung called the large as self. That we have a connection with something that is sacred and spiritual and has been called God, Goddess, uh, higher power, Tao, lots of things. It's more than our ego can ever fully grasp. It gives us meaning. So when we connect with the archetype that is deep within us, it also connects us with that deeper layer. And this, plus the archetype of the self, gives us a sense that we're here for a purpose, that we're inherently spiritual beings on a human path, rather than human beings who may or may not be on a spiritual path. And what that does for us is make us feel that we belong here and we have a purpose here in this time. And given that we have now had since the late 60s, from the late 60s until now, there has been an influence of feminism. There's been a generation of, of feminists who had, who chose partners as equals and had children that they raised, boys or girls, to be, to see each other as equals. And so as we, tilt into the 21st century, we also are facing the potential of the end of the planet as we know it and humanity as we know it. And it is like when Artemis and Athena come together to do things such as saving trees and children and uh, empowering women as mothers and as choice makers. Now, now the planet needs us. Um, it needs us to be whole human beings who have made choices in our lives, and it includes whether we are mothers or not. Uh, we can choose not to if we have the power to do so, which makes a huge difference on the population of the planet as well. So 
Athena and Artemis together with brother environmentalists and and men who are really the emphasis on brother rather than father over. The, the fate of us all are in the hands of certain archetypes, and I'm just emphasizing two of the many that I've written about in Goddesses and Every Woman and Gods and Every Man, because we have an archetype that is also contrasexual. So mine it happens to be Hermes, the messenger god. So that's why I can talk into this camera and use words. It's, it's uh, Artemis, which is my primary archetype, and which I wrote a book about, um, doesn't use words. <laughs> All kinds of activist good causes, spiritual callings, exist in the world. How do you choose them? The way to do it really is from inside out. Something comes along and you respond to it, and it's meaningful to you, and you care about whatever this cause is, because well, if you're Artemis, it's, it's because it has to do yeah. with with saving trees and animals and things like that, because you always have wanted to do that. So it's like something comes along, and from inside you know it is meaningful, either because of the mix of archetype and or the family dynamic and your own suffering. Like when I meet the women at the UN who are heading anti-trafficking organizations who have been trafficked, got out, their sole work is to stop this trafficking, to save the girls. So that, that's step one of the assignment, it's meaningful, you know, and then the second one for me is that a way of saying that it's fulfilling because you're using your talent, you're using your mind, you're using your heart in some way this whatever it is that is your assignment is yours and you are absorbed in it. So the urge is for people to know that at various times in their lives they are at a transition place where it's the question of assignment comes up and only you can decide what it is to be. Lots of people will tell you what you ought to do with your life but at major points it's up to you to to know from inside out that it's meaningful to you. And then the last is that it's motivated by love, which is the only energy that the more you give away, the more the other has, the more you have, and the more the world has. It's the only non-zero-sum energy in this world. And it feeds your soul. And there's something about we came into the world in a, as a vulnerable little baby and we came in with a soul. So we came in essentially as a spiritual being born into human form. And we have, we have the, the journey to make, which has to do with the growing soul and making a difference inside and out. It's good work. <laughs>